Welcome to Gu Dao Jingxing, Walking the Timeless Way, a podcast that digs deeply into Taoism and Tao Te Ching to uncover its timeless wisdom and talk about how to apply it to today's chaotic world. I'm Ian Felton, practicing psychotherapist, and I'm joined by my co-host, executive coach, David Wong. Hi, David. Happy New Year. Hello, Ian. Happy New Year to you. It's hard to believe it's it's 2022, and I know the we're still in the midst of COVID winter, and I know most of us were not expecting that it was going to be this kind of situation two years into it, but but here here we are. How are you faring in your part of the of the country? Well, uh, yesterday uh, the weather was uh, quite warm and sunny here, and uh, so my wife and I we went to a nearby beach, and uh, since I didn't get enough sleep by watching the um, the New York uh, the the you know the Times Square. Uh, New Year's Eve celebration, and also I, I woke up very early in the morning to um, I woke up very early morning to see the sunrise because I, I wanted mm. this uh, almost like a, a, a new beginning. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get enough sleep. So in the sunshine on the beach, we set up a tent. I fell asleep until I my feet felt something really cold. And now the, and the tide was really like coming to me and we had to very, uh, in desperation, we, we have to, time to wake yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it's good that you were someplace so warm. It's, it's negative 16 here wow. this morning in Minnesota. So if, if, if my feet were in anything cold outside right now, I think I'd probably have frostbite. I see. I see. I see. So I know we've we've wrapped up our study of Tao Te Ching, and we're going to move into exploring some other themes of Taoism, which leads me kind of our first um, question that I have. That I know a lot of people, when they hear me say Taoism, mm -hmm. they'll say something like, "Oh, you mean ta Tao or Taoism?" Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's always kind of an awkward conversation. And I wondered if we could just take a couple minutes since we're going to just kind of introduce uh, some basic themes of Taoism mm -hmm. and explain why we say Taoism with a D sound mm -hmm. and why we spell it with a D mm -hmm. and and maybe explain that difference between um, spelling Taoism with a D and mm -hmm. with a T. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I... I experienced the same thing when I uh, first uh, came to the, this country, like um, very early on, I remember at one of the seminars at Harvard, you know, people use Taoism and I was puzzled because that's not how, you know, Tao is, uh, you know, pronounced uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the original language. So mm -hmm. I asked uh, my friends about it and they told me it's uh, it's something called a, a wagile system mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. a it's an early translation yeah. of Taoism into uh the uh, english language speaking world and that would have been like early night early to mid 1900s right like maybe eight 70 or 80 years ago yeah even earlier than that uh, even earlier because the Taoism, uh the Taoist uh texts were introduced to the west through the uh through the the early missionaries Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sent to China, and they they were able to uh, dig into the you know ancient texts, and uh, together okay. with uh, Confucianism, you know those ideas were introduced mm -hmm. during the time I would say you know um, the in Enlightenment period in in mm -hmm. the West, because at that time people were you know pu were puzzled by the you know different kinds of different kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, some civilization that mm -hmm. survived so, for such a long time without the notion of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so Tao or Taoism is a, a mispronunciation of the Chinese word, and Taoism is how people say it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're seeing more and more uh, pronunciation as a Taoism, and also mm -hmm. the uh, spelling as D A O. Mm -hmm. ISM, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And that's using, so the modern way of Romanizing Chinese is, is using the, the system called uh, pinyin, pinyin, yeah, which basically means to, to spell something out the way that it sounds. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the same thing as, uh, you know, Confucianism, uh, you know, we, we, at first I thought, oh, uh, Kongzi, meaning, you know, uh, Confucius, right? In the, uh, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, Kongzi has an English name, Confucius. Because we all say Kongzi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like who's this con who's this Confucius character? Right. 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 That's another early example of uh, people translating using a, I would say, Latinized version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Con Confucius does not exist in in China. Kongzi exists. Kongzi. In China. Yeah. Kongzi. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you kind of clarifying some of that because I know it can be very confusing and and sometimes people think that they're different things but mm -hmm. it's like no tao t-a-o is just a mispronunciation or an or a very old early translation from a long time ago but tao is actually the the modern way of of trying to get closer to the chinese way of pronouncing it and we don't have to get into tones and all that but but in Chinese, you would also use a particular tone yeah. when you say yeah. when you say Dao, which would sound like Dao. Yes, the falling, the forced tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that we're kind of through that, um, hopefully that clarifies some things for maybe some people who have wanted to under understand that that had never really had that explained before. Today we 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 want to focus on. We've been, we've been doing this podcast for a while and we jumped into it in the middle of our studying Tao Te Ching, but we didn't necessarily kind of guide people in a elementary way through some of the themes of, of Taoism. And so we're going to kind of start off today just exploring a question why should we even care mm. about Taoism? Mm. That's a great question. I mean, there there's a lot to it, um, and we're going to break it break it down. Um, but maybe we can just start off with um, a simple question that has a, a, a broad um, application. What do you think that it is? What are some of the core messages from Taoism that you think could make it valuable for people who are living in today's modern world? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, first of all, to answer that question, uh, you know, requires us to kind of really distill and, na and, na and nail down, you know, a lot of the uh, ideas uh, in the ancient texts uh, both Laozi and Zhuangzi and others, uh, I would say the core message is, um, you know, for all those, uh, you know, different thinkers, come down to, uh, you know, maybe the a sense of, uh, of reality. I, I sort of feel like in the age we're mm -hmm. living in, uh, we live in a more like a distorted reality field. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, uh, in order to solve today's uh, problems and manage conflicts, among others, somehow we need to arrive at a, a shared sense of reality. I feel Taoism uh, in some way gives us um, I wouldn't say a prescription on reality mm -hmm. right. helps, helps us understand and help us navigate uh, in the navigate the world we are living in and um, and and still find there is reality there but maybe that's mm -hmm. the reality not you or I or maybe other individuals think about 
I think that it's so incredibly important. I think you hit the nail on the head on how Taoism can be helpful today. Just this distorted lens that we see things through. I don't think that that distortion is unique to our period in time. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, I agree. Yeah. that's one reason why it's timeless because like the dark ages would have certainly have been a distorted time, but it's almost like we're moving into a new medieval period that's ironically post enlightenment era. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this dark period is one of distortions built from, well, it, it, it's being kind of spelled out, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg has made the metaverse, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. essentially a world that's just total distortion, total mm -hmm. illusion that we're all going to supposedly want to live within. I mean, what could be more of a medieval dark age than that when mm -hmm. we're going to leave the real world behind and live in this metaverse? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's certainly mid, kind of like medieval living in this unreal place. So I think that what you said just makes perfect sense that that Taoism can try to help us see reality and see through the distortions that our our society and our our minds are creating. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when we study the, uh, the the ancient text together, you know, over the past few years, um, I always you know, got the, the feeling that um, what is being conveyed through those texts uh, is a kind of a reality. Uh, I would say, okay, here's the way I would de describe it. Because and when you look at, look across different philosophies or religions or, you know, our understanding of the world, you know, there, there, definitely a group that helps us understand, oh, that reality is um, above us, meaning transcendent. You know, uh, Christianity is one of them. Maybe mm -hmm. Plato's world of, you know, the nouns uh, sense is the, the ultimate mm -hmm. reality, me meaning the perfect good and forms are all kinds. Uh, so those mm -hmm. are the transcendent uh, world that we are aiming at, we are stri striving for. And the second one is more, uh, I would I call it not a, not a transcendent, but imminent, meaning living in us, um, uh, kind of a this worldly. Uh, mm -hmm. Kongzi, Confucius, Confucius, I think, acknowledged. Uh, basically, he was trying to convey to his students that don't worry about that transcendent world because, you know, only when we live fully this world. Uh, then we can understand maybe whatever that 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 the other world is there. So that imminence, and then Buddhism is talking about the non-permanence, meaning everything mm -hmm. is changing, everything you know we're we're living in an illusion. Uh, I personally, uh, you know, the uh, like Taoism, mm, the the ideas or the way uh, it's portrayed to me. Uh, is is more appealing because I feel it's it has transcendence, imminence, uh, in, uh, you know, impermanence, impermanence, and the permanence. Yes, all in one. Mm -hmm. uh, because in uh, you know personally, I want to be in the world, but not of the world in, in, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Because mm -hmm. I feel like I only have one life. You know, meaning like. David, you know, mm -hmm. as a person in here, but also I'm beyond that. So, um, in some way, I, I think, uh, you know, we talked about what kind of reality, what, what Tao is. I think that it, Tao maybe has certain, you know, transcendent, you know, attributes or nature, mm -hmm. but also Tao is in us, is in our everyday. Mm -hmm. And Tao has a ever-changing uh, nature to it. All the things are changing all the time, not permanent. Mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, there's that stillness, that quietness, which is all, always there. That's the constancy. So in living in our world, in the chaotic world, uh, you know, we all want to find, you know, something that is not doctrinal, not, not fixed or rigid, mm -hmm. something to hold on to. But we do want to, you know, amidst all, all the changes, we want to find that quiet place in us. We also want to trans transcend all the labels mm -hmm. throw around in there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we, we don't want to be too far away, you know, from our reality and claiming superiority because of that higher ground, whatever it is. We are all together in this muddiness of life. Exactly. And, and that's exactly why I not just love Taoism, but through my exploration of philosophy and, and, and cognitive science and mm -hmm. psychology, mm -hmm. I actually want to put in a, a middle ground. You talked about the, the transcendent and also the eminent. And I, th I think what's been really awesome is that there's also kind of a middle ground in between that has been explored and um, really articulated conceptually mm -hmm. by a, a group of thinkers underneath um, cognitive science, and they call it inactive cognitive science. Mm -hmm. and, and if anyone wants to kind of get the underpinnings of that, there's a, a, the introductory book to it would be The Tree of Knowledge by um, Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, and the follow-up book to that, which is um, more detailed, is called The Embodied Mind, mm -hmm. and um, that's by Evan Thompson, Eleanor Roche, and Francisco Varela. And what it talks about, using biology, it explores how this middle ground exists between the eminent and the transcendent mm -hmm. where we, we are environment. We're a product of the environment mm -hmm. our, our, and our nervous systems were created by the environment and, and are situated within the environment. Mm -hmm. What we experience is a unique world that's brought forth by our nervous system, mm -hmm. but it's brought forth within a real world. So it, it doesn't have the solipsism of Buddhism where like everything that you're experiencing is sort of just this total transcendent kind of karmic mm. dance. That's all, it's all customized just for you, mm. right? Like there's, there's that kind of solipsism where you see you, you, you believe that everything that you're experiencing is just tailored for you and it's all this part of like specialized information that you're getting in that way, but rather it's this razor's edge where you, you are experiencing a unique world mm -hmm. that your nervous system is bringing forth, but there is an actual real world and a real environment that you're interacting with but it's constantly being produced by interactions between your nervous system and the environment. So there's not a total separation Interesting. between Interesting. you and the environment. Yeah, which reminds me of uh, the, uh, the notion of wu wo liang wang. Wu means the mm -hmm. object, objective. Wo mm -hmm. means the subjective. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, we, we think there is a, 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 maybe a boundaries separating the mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. But when you achieve a certain state, those two things merged. There's yes. not quite a, you know, like a clear cut, like separate. It is not clear cut. It's, it's semi-permeable. I mean, there is an, there's a constant interaction. Don't you think sometimes our, because of that, um, you know, because of this separation or maybe artificial separation in our head, that creates, you know, creates problems. Maybe yes. pragmatic problems like 
me and others, right? Yeah. Me and the environment. Exactly. So when we think these two things are separate, sometimes, you know, I have to dominate. I have to mm -hmm. be the master of the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. It, it, yeah. Without a doubt of this, this idea that somehow there is a, a real I that has to its, assert itself. And I think that's where some of the boot, um, Buddhist ideas are very similar to Taoism and why they work so well together. But yeah, there, there's more of a merging that, yes, I, I am an organism. And yes, I have my own experience, but I'm also part of the environment. Like I'm, I can be in harmony with the environment. I can let go way. Yes. And, yes. and that's kind of a, a better way of going about things where I only do what's necessary to kind of move the next thing forward, but in a way that makes sense for the whole picture, not just for what I want from an ego perspective. Exactly. Exactly. So going back to your original question, when I think about Taoism, I think my my own self, and um, I think it's just to recognize the existence of myself, but also be aware and be just to to realize that there's a larger world out there beyond myself, mm -hmm. and that way. You know, you ask the question why people in the modern world should care about, you know, I would say maybe we, we should care about it not to kind of hope uh, to get a set of uh, doctrines or dogmas, you know, from Taoism, but also kind of receive uh, through that portal to really look at things differently, interact with others differently. What's that looking differently? Like, and, and why, why do we need to look at things differently? differently? Well, what's that different? Like, what, 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 why do we need to do things differently? Because we are stuck. I feel like in the world, the world we are living in, for whatever reason, we're stuck, we're anxious, we're frustrated. Hmm. It's not working. It's not working. So I think there's a lot of different ways of, searching for answers, you know, both mm -hmm. individually. I think that's the very reason why we, you know, we invest our time uh, studying that together. And just like many other people in the world nowadays, we're searching for answers, but we're not searching for, you know, answers like that being traditionally taught us, like beliefs, a set of mm -hmm. things we need uh, dogma. Dogma, yeah, I would say dogma. Yeah, but clearly there's order in the world. There's, you know, there's yeah. natural order. Yeah. And um, if there's no order, I I wouldn't imagine. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't know how the world is in is functioning. The well, the world is functioning beyond this functionalities now. Totally. You know, the and nature, that's the thing that the people sun, forget. The, yeah. the, the first sunrise I saw yesterday, you know, yesterday, right? It still, you know, rises very slowly on time, on time, 7, 8, 7 18 a.m. in my local time. I see yeah, that. look at that. It doesn't even need an alarm clock. It's amazing that the universe doesn't need people to wake up and tell it what to do. Yeah, yeah. So clearly there's order there. But it's not the order that, you know, politicians or theologians, uh, theologians or philosophers, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of order right. they paint. Maybe they are pointing yep. at something, but not the thing that, you know, we need to follow to the letter. Right. All of them want to use their human egos to, to decide what the truth is and, and tell people what the truth is. And we know that all that, I mean, that's the real bullshit. I mean, that, that's the thing that keeps causing us to get stuck. The world ran before there was people, the whole universe ran before there was people. And yet somehow people feel like without us using 
all of our calculations mm -hmm. that 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 somehow things are going to fall apart. I mean, if you've been to the wilderness, if you've been to the savanna, if you've been to the jungle, if you've been for a walk in the forest, you can see all of these places run themselves without human interference. They've done quite well, and it's actually human interference now that is kind of making everything break down in a pretty catastrophic way. Interesting. So, you know, just, you know, add to what you're saying, what we are hearing every day seems like you need this, you need that, you need us to help you run the world. That's the yeah, kind yeah. of the underlying message. So, you know, you need this feeling like a, you know, the, the lacking and also the absence of, um, I, I think the word I'm, I'm looking for is, um, I feel like there are a lot of pet peddlers or salespeople oh, yeah. around me nowadays in sometimes in very obvious blunt ways, sometimes in very subtle ways, just selling me like, you need me, you need this to live a life, to make your life happier. Yeah, I mean, I think that the that that word peddler is 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 perfect, and I think you know our politicians are perfect examples of that. That for whatever reason, and ironic as as it is, but you know, Trump came across to me as the biggest peddler that I've ever seen in my life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. But somehow we're in this place where there's so many people who feel like you need some kind of peddler to point you in the direction that you need, or maybe just as a way of, I mean, really speaking to people in a way that, that resonates that the message was so resonated so much that weren't able to see the lack of sincerity behind mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cause I think he, he, he does know how to talk to people. And I think that that's, what's important that he really does understand what people are looking for and what their needs are. But unfortunately he's just not a very sincere person. And as that kind of, kind of peddler. And so, so he is brilliant in his methods, in his uh, communication, communicational effectiveness, but it seems like he's pointing yeah. us in the wrong direction. Yeah. And, and so that's exactly it. Like, so how, how can Dow help us to, so again, those needs that are real, I mean, the people have real needs, Yes. but how can Dow help in a way? that someone like Trump and these politicians can't, who are just peddlers. Yeah, maybe then I, I think it's, uh, it helps to explore, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about it in our, uh, you know, in our future podcast about those needs. I feel like those needs, somehow mm -hmm. we need to articulate more clearly to understand what really those needs are. And then That's look at the world around us and see, you know, are these politicians are really meeting our needs or are we? So, so I think without the clear understanding of our own needs, we are very easily get, you know, misled into the, in the into the wrong places and by the wrong, by the, you know, the, by the many people out there. That makes sense. So maybe what I'll do is just kind of shift gears then and make it just a little bit more personal because I know we we all have needs and mm -hmm. what what are the ways that you feel like applying Taoism has helped you personally or or could help you personally in in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you know, as I mentioned, first and foremost is the, a way of looking at the world. You know, there is a, you know, there's a, uh, you know, an 
idiom or there's a common saying that we all need to you know think out of the box right so that mm -hmm. metaphorical box is the kind of things that uh, i use taoism to help me think a little bit uh beyond i would say beyond my own way of thinking beyond other way of thinking i think that fundamental learning I'm practicing every day will help me save a lot of time and energy mm. and not get into not get misled or get misguided because life is short you know maybe what I you know in a certain box I, I you know I think certain things that matter or really important are not that important Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the times, you know, when I work with, you know, business leaders in the leadership coaching area is to clarify for themselves and clarify for their employees and organizations what truly matters. Mm. So that is, I would say, the one of the learning is uh, to be able to see things as they are, not as we are so what truly matters yeah but what is that what truly matters um well first of all i i think there is a difference to in, each in, individuals because you know as you said earlier our nervous systems our upbringing our environment you know shapes but that doesn't shapes you know what truly matters to us in some way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I think there is a, a shared, there's a common set of what truly really matters, you know, among people across space and time. Uh, I would say uh, at the very higher level, um, human connection, human, mm. yeah, that kind of deep, not a superficial transactional connectivity is one of them. Yes. So that's just, I want to just press pause for a second because when you said that, I'm thinking about, well, the society that we live in, not just in the US, but even in like how China now has changed, where, where capital matters, mm -hmm. like definitely in the US, cap, I mean, that's what capitalism means, mm -hmm. that cap capital is at the top and everything else is part of a system of financial capital. Mm -hmm. And so in the Taoist view of the world, what matters is human connection, deep human connection. Mm -hmm. And that's a byproduct. Like, I don't like that doesn't exist in I'm pretty sure that doesn't exist in any financial equations and any economic equations. I mean, maybe there's someone out there trying to, you know, create some formula that factors in human connection, but not for but what I wanna, sake. I always feel yeah. like there's a talk about human connection, even among like when you watch the ads nowadays about uh, personal finance, you know, there's talk mm -hmm. about the family and the future, mm -hmm. you know, education of the kids and, and health and retirement, all those. But I feel like they are just used as a means. I mean, not to be too cynical about it, but, uh, yeah. you know, they, they kind of. A, but it's fair. I mean, we probably should be kind of cynical about it. They're trying to make money. They don't really care about families. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when somebody really cares. I mean, caring in a way that is human means maybe to use the metaphor from Tao, Taoism, from the uh, text from Tao Te Ching, it's like heaven's way. Heaven is not possessive, but we are all beneficiaries of the air and the sky and sunshine. But heaven doesn't, you know, like looking looking at myself, right. looking at me, yeah. you know, I, yeah. all hey, David, here's some stuff for you. Yeah. Hey, David, I, I've done you a favor. 
Oh, I, yeah. you know, I think that way, that human connection has meaning. We are all beneficiaries and participants in that human connectivity, meaning naturally I'm helping you, you are helping me, that kind of thing. And, and, and we're part of something bigger. This doesn't exist just for my, you know, uh, uh, so I can eventually be a billionaire and, and shoot my own rocket ship into space. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So getting back to your question, I think that, that, you know, different ways of looking at things of once you kind of start to appreciate there's maybe there's something, some, something in the world is not what, what it seems or what other people tell you, you start go a little bit deeper to uncover there is a reality there and that reality uh including human connection connection how the world cooperates uh, you know it's just like like an ecosystem right it's a, it's all connected that could potentially uh changes our way of living our lives and connecting with other people but it's 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 not going to be like overnight because unfortunately, you know, I wish I had been, in, you know, I had been immersed uh, in this way of knowing things, but already something already happened to my mind. Mm -hmm. So in order to um, make that transition, I, I feel like it's one thing to kind of start to know it, to appreciate it, but that knowing and appreciation takes time to you know, to, to be translating into mm -hmm. action and uh, my true nature of things. I know it's there, but it's not my true nature because I've already adopted a second yeah. na a nature, maybe a social nature. Socialized. Yeah, yeah, that stands in that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's like water flowing through a valley. If, if a valley hit or a stream bed has already been kind of carved, yeah. it's going to take a while if if water wants to take a new path it doesn't just happen yeah. overnight it, it takes time to wear that new new path yes that's true so one thing that we've talked about a few times and i and i think it's really important is the relationship between kongzo or confucianism and taoism because i think kongzo he really cared deeply about the real world he he did care very deeply about human connection yes but he had a very non-daoist way of trying to attain it that i think ultimately people found to be very burdensome and kind of difficult to um, maintain throughout a, a lifespan, but his intentions were good. And maybe talk a little bit about sure. Kongsa and Taoism and maybe how they can kind of complement each other and maybe also where Kongsa maybe has some limitations that Taoist would say, eh, I sure. can't really sure. do that. Um, that's a great question. That is a great question because I think a lot of the Confucian ideas have grown through throughout the ages that sometimes it's getting harder and harder to distinguish what Confucius as the originator of these ideas thought and what other people thought. Because I think later on, you know, if you study Chinese history, Confucianism becomes the kind of the official ideology, you know, mm -hmm. of course, when you look at the dynasties closely, uh, the, 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 the powerful people, they didn't just use uh, Confucius, you know, in their whole toolkit of ruling the country, they incorporate maybe Taoism, especially in Han Dynasty, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very early on, the early part of Han Dynasty actually embraced Taoism as the kind of quote unquote, official beliefs. 
And, and Confucianism or, or Kongsa, it, it's just a set of rules, right? Like about how people interact with each other based upon their relationship to each other. Well, that is that is what it gradually grew into. I think there's a lot of uh, fluidity and also uh, room for, uh, you know, personalization among the students uh, mm. uh, of Confucius. If you look, if you read the, uh, if you read the, the uh, analects, sometimes for the same answers, Confucius provide a different uh, uh, angle mm -hmm. uh, to different students who have, you know, different personalities. So it wasn't as rigid as what probably governments turned it into. I think more and more it served, it, it, it just, it, it was used as a more of a, a tool for mm -hmm. governing, mm -hmm. uh, which still I think has its own merits. In other words, uh, I think throughout ages, um, I think that emphasis on education uh, and the, that emphasis on the basic unit of family, uh, I still believe nowadays is a core of the Chinese civilization, uh, uh, which enabled to s survive despite all the excesses, excessive behaviors of emperors and dynasties. You know, clearly there was, you know, a uh, cultural influence there, you know, thanks mm -hmm. to Confucius. Uh, maybe throughout the ages, not through the explicit like teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Well, there's a teaching in the education about Confucianism, mm -hmm. but I think people in that cultural environment have been conditioned to behave in that way, casting, mm -hmm a skeptical eye of other social institutions. Because uh, mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, in the Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. When I came into this country, at first, you know, I can't help comparing where I came from and where, you know, I am mm -hmm. living. I would say, you know, I really uh, appreciate and en en enjoy, and I think, uh, you know, Chinese society can learn a lot about the, mm -hmm that larger social community uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, in this tradition, like the democracy, I mean, not mm -hmm. democracy, like what we're talking about right. these days in a very federal, you know, like a very right, right. conceptual way. But when I travel in America, I see a lot of the people live in the, in the community beyond their family. You know, I always feel mm -hmm. like yeah. maybe Chinese people are thinking too narrowly about uh, mm -hmm. their families. They only care mm -hmm. about their families. I mean, when mm -hmm. you go to China for a long yeah. time and still now it's a challenge to enforce the, the traffic rules. Right, because people are just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not necessarily that considered. Exactly, uh, exactly. Strangers on the street. exactly. So I see that Chinese people can, uh, you know, through maybe through, uh, you know, the larger society they're mm -hmm. living in today to be more and more, uh, I would say, socially responsive, responsible, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. maybe they, they care more about uh, other people than their family members and their close mm -hmm. friends. Um, uh, I think, you know, but at the same time, family has been the foundation. In other words, Mm -hmm. You know, like in the Confucian test te text, if you want to build a harmonious society, you have to build a harmonious family, mm -hmm. because that's where we practice all our virtues. And that's where, and even Lao Tzu says that that if if you want to master Tao, you master it within yourself, then you master it within your house. Yes, within your family then you master it within your town and then the state, et cetera. Like, but it starts with you and then your family. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I like both, uh, Confucius, uh, Confucius thoughts and also Taoism is to look at the world more from, uh, uh, you know, concentric, uh, con con uh, you know, like, like a circle, mm -hmm. right. From the mm -hmm. inner circle radiating into the mm -hmm. larger circle of the, mm -hmm. The cosmos. Um, I think in the more 
you know, societal driven paradigm. Uh, you hear a lot of the people talking about uh, fighting for just in, uh, fighting for justice or saving the world or changing the world, but their families are mess. They kind of, uh, you know, uh, work it in the opposite factor. In other yeah. words, instead, like their, their, their marriages are dysfunctioning, their mm -hmm. kids are problematic, but they are all busy all the time yes. to save the world. That, that, that doesn't make any right. sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. And, and I think that when you were talking about, one, I'm glad that you made the distinction that you think that one thing that at least Chinese culture could could still do to grow is have more of that um, citizen of the world yes. approach. Like, yes, care about your family, but that doesn't mean treat the person on the street as if they're, you know, a piece of garbage or, yeah. in, or yeah. In, yeah. indifferent. Yeah, especially how they treat strangers. I think, uh, let's say in um, in the Bible, in Christianity, uh, the Jew Jewish tradition, there's always this notion of you know, treating strangers as your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, I think Ch Chinese people have a long way to go in that way, in that sense. Mm -hmm. If they, they are, I mean, it doesn't mean like Confucius didn't uh, mm -hmm. emphasize uh, uh, the progression. Like, I think I remember there's a saying in the text that says, you know, now if you treat your parents, right, as your parents, mm -hmm. you should mm -hmm. treat other people's parents as trans parents. If you treat your sons as your own sons and daughters, you should treat other sons and daughters about mm -hmm. the same way. So that kind mm -hmm. of empathy, that kind yeah. of thing. Universal it, love. Universal love, I think in the Confucian wisdom has been said, but mm -hmm. how does that, how, but it hasn't manifested in yeah. the sense that it becomes a social norm that give priority to that uh, progression from your family to the society. Well, again, it's it's this both and where yes, we, we do things so binary these days and we'll talk about like American culture versus Chinese culture. Yes, so yes. Like, no, it's actually this both and. It's like, can you imagine if we had the deep familial respect and care and organization of Chinese culture combined with more of this global thinking of maybe a lot of the modern um, uh, American values like with around social justice and, and things like that, it, it, it would be great. But like, it, it's just funny when you talk about, yes, you have these families that are <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 all like very social justice oriented families, but it's like the 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 family lives are chaos. Like the 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 parents are busy working, and the kids are probably like maybe saying like "fuck you, mom" and yeah, like that. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But they're very you know concerned about things, and there's this kind of irony in in that too. Yeah, I think in that sense, you know, we I I, I totally agree with you. I think. Uh, if you look at the the cultural, the typical cultural behavior in this country and in China, I think that for most people, that binary thinking is the norm. It's yeah. almost like one, you know, you you know, um, you know, from the heart of your wisdom that those things tend to kind of work together. Mm -hmm. But when you really do it, different culture prioritize one thing over the other. Yeah. That's where I think potentially Taoism um, can provide a uh, almost a relief or maybe a yeah. liberation mm -hmm. to this way of thinking. Uh, if you look at Lao Tzu mm -hmm. and especially Zhuang Tzu, uh, you know, we haven't got a chance to talk about the, their similarities and differences. We will. Uh, we will. And I would say for Zhuang Tzu, that kind of thinking of dualities uh, and how to liberate ourselves to, to achieve uh, a truly life of freedom, I think it's really a, 
you know, a contribution to Taoism uh, on the foundation of Laozi. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But just to kind of summarize, is that Taoism is not a binary way of thinking. It wants to encompass all of the poles and everything in between in a way to make sense of things depending upon what's kind of happening in the moment. And also based upon, well, just kind of following the natural flow mm -hmm. of things. So, you know, that liberation that we're talking about, it's a liberation from dogma. It's a liberation from ideology. Mm -hmm. It's the, the freedom though of, of being deeply connected to others around us and the environment that we live in. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good good uh, summary of the the essence. I would say the essence of Taoism as as we have you know studied so far. I'm sure mm -hmm. there will be new insights, new learnings as we move you know move on this journey. And the stillness. We've talked a little bit about the stillness. I'll just kind of add that on there too. That with Lao Tzu. The, the stillness is a key part of it too. So the stillness that can exist with with us and how important that that is as well, this idea of giving space to just let things happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the st stillness comes from the awareness and realization of the beginning. Everything in between is very dynamics. It's like a water flowing. But that stillness, you know, that sense of stillness comes from our in the middle of doing things and thinking about what this doing is all about. What's our intent? Mm -hmm. Without you know, living in that space of stillness, many times our actions can be very misguided and futile. Yeah, so it'll be great for us to also get into that. Like, how do we align our actions with Tao? How do we make our actions count? Yes, yes. Um, maybe who is distracting us or um, steering us the wrong direction mm -hmm. and, and why being aware of when um, maybe there's forces that are moving us against Tao mm -hmm. in a way that's not helpful to us or anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I have really appreciated our talk today. I feel like I have a much deeper understanding about why I should care about Taoism and hopefully our listeners do as well. So thank you again. And, and thank you for starting the new year off with this great discussion. I enjoy our conversation and I'm hoping that uh, with you and uh, with our listeners and throughout new year where, you know, it's going to be a, a great year of, uh, you know, new discoveries, new learning, growth and possibilities. And for our listeners, you can always come to walkingthetimelessway.com to read more articles about Taoism and to get in touch with us. 